Catherine Jenkins Johnson, Principal of Jenkins Johnson Gallery in San Francisco and New York. Thank you for joining us. My team and I hope that you're healthy, safe, and well during these very challenging times. We welcome you to our seventh Conversation and Culture, a weekly discussion during the COVID-19 pandemic with artists, artists, curators, and collectors on current art world topics. Today, gallery artist Margaret Boland will be in conversation with independent curator and entrepreneur Dexter Wimberly. Margaret Boland is a realist painter. She was born in the small southern town of Burlington, North Carolina. She has a BA from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. She's a faculty member at the New York Academy of Art. Margaret has exhibited at institutions including the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, the Contemporary Art Museum, Raleigh, North Carolina, the Delaware Art Museum, and Orange County Center for Contemporary Art. Margaret has lived in Brooklyn for over 30 years. Dexter Wimberly and Margaret have been friends for a very long time. He's also a friend of the gallery. Dexter was one of the first curators to present a project at Jenkins Johnson Projects in Brooklyn, New York. Dexter has organized exhibitions and developed programs with galleries and institutions throughout the world, including the Third Line in Dubai, Contemporary Art Museum, Raleigh, North Carolina, the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, and the Koki Arts in Tokyo, and the Museum of Arts and Design in New York. He is the founder of Art World Conference, a business and financial literacy platform for visual artists. On a personal note, he and his wife, Kaneko, just celebrated their eighth wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary. <laughs> thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. Again, I want yeah. to thank our audience for joining us. I invite you to ask questions through the conversation. You can find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please send us your questions. Also, feel free, feel free to join the chat during the conversation. Margaret, thank you for joining us. And Dexter, thank you for joining us from Japan. I know thank you. for a real treat. <laughs> it's You're an honor. Thank you for having me. Well, well, thank you so much for that, Karen, and uh, thank you, Margaret. And uh, as you can see from my, um, you know, um, very domestic background here, um, I'm not home. I'm actually in my mother-in-law's kitchen right now, about 6,000 miles away from where Margaret is. I'm in uh, Hayama, Japan. It's a small town about an hour south of Tokyo with a population of less than 35,000 people. So um, I'm, I'm a little out of my element here, but at the same time, very much in my element. Um, and I'm happy to be doing this and so happy to be connecting with you, Margaret. I'm always happy to be connected with you as well, Dexter. I was gonna say, I was, I'm also not in my studio. COVID threw me into my, I'm in my dining room in a corner and the dining room <laughs> looks like a, a bomb went off in it. But one of the things about these things is you could just parcel out the place that looks okay. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wish I didn't have such harsh overhead lighting, but yeah. as you, uh, as you already know, it's uh, four o'clock in the morning here. So yes. I'm a little, uh, I'm a little like uh, impoverished for opportunities of places in house where I can actually <laughs> set up and have this conversation. That would, um, that would be true. <laughs> At least with your children running in the back. Yeah. Absolutely. They're absolutely. So, so um, Karen was so generous and gave a, um, you know, um, a good sort of background for our conversation and went into a bit of your, um, your bio. So uh, we don't really have to do that. We can kind of jump ahead and start talking about uh, more about what you've been up to as an artist and really give uh, the people who are participating in this, this conversation an understanding of uh, what is the driving force behind um, what you create as an artist. So assuming that there's a good percentage of people on this call that have not stood in front of your paintings. Can we start off like sort of talking a little bit about who Margaret Bolin is and what brought, what brought Margaret Bolin to the world as an artist? All right, yes. Margaret Boland is a, a woman who was born and, and, and don't feel like and, and don't feel like you have to talk in the third person. <laughs> that's a good that's a good interesting point. Um, I am a, an old southern lady. I was born in a small southern town. When you were talking about the size of the town you're in, I was raised in a town not much larger. Everybody knew everybody else. 
My mother was a preschool teacher. My dad was a dry cleaner who had left uh, high school, didn't graduate from high school, to join World War II in the last year of it. And I was raised in that southern town in a segregated world that became desegregated when I was in junior high. And when you ask what drives me, I did not start off. We're going to be looking at my paintings today. And the, what I'm known for and the notoriety I'm known for as well is painting African-American subjects. I didn't begin that way, but my life has been always driven by the subject. Mm -hmm. The first paintings that we're going to look at, I was painting a girlfriend of mine, Anna, who is a dwarf. And I have been doing paintings of her uh, before that were portraits. And I, they were, she was always clothed. And one day, Anna was looking at other paintings I had done of a model we'll see coming up, Claire, who was very, is very beautiful. And she was naked. And Anna asked me why I never painted her naked. And I had thought it was outrageous to ask. So I realized, <laughs> however, though, that it had been perceived by her to be my saying she wasn't beautiful enough. Mm. So I started to think about what do I do? How do I cast Anna? And I thought about Olympia, uh, Manet's Olympia. And I thought, okay, in that painting, there's a white woman, there's a black woman, there's a cat and some flowers. Mm -hmm. And the, I talk, I speak to my students a great deal about composition. And in that painting, the viewer is placed in the position of the John walking into a courtesan's bedroom. That image, as we all know, of, of Olympia has de been derived from the ideal of beauty that comes down from odalisques from Jerome straight through. And Manet flipped it by saying, this is a real person in real time. I was very interested in that. And when I've ever, I have looked at that painting, I have always seen those two women as two comrades in a foxhole. They're both, being, they're both being looked at by that man that's entering that door. The young black woman whose dress can get out with the flowers. The other woman is left there, but I've always seen them as compatriots. And I began to paint them in that way. I turned to a friend of mine, Robert, and I asked him if he, Anna was a friend, but I asked him if he knew a, a young African-American girl who would like to pose for me. He gave me one of the biggest gifts of my life, Kenyatta Frazier. Kenyatta Frazier came into my life working for me in these paintings. And I think she's listening now. She's, she's been a major part of my life for a decade. And Kenyatta, what is that beautiful? And immediately began posing for me. And the way that I saw, re, I reconfigured this painting for a modern, modern audience was I thought that I did perceive the position of the modern white woman as Anna, depicted by Anna. Anna is a friend of mine. She and I, I'm five feet 10. She's much smaller. When we go out to a bar drinking, it's, it's quite something. Um, we had developed a good friendship and Anna understood what I was doing with this. And I sensed, this is, this is the most honest thing I can say, I sensed that the two of them said what I wish to say about the position of women vis-a-vis -vis the gaze of men. I know that's, that's a much heavier, much right, loaded right. subject at this point. At this moment in time, I didn't mean it to be as political as it has grown to be. I am very close to men. My, I have a son and two grandsons. But I did know in this, I, I felt this. Women have throughout time been told by other women, their mothers, this is my own experience, that the most important thing in my life was to be attractive to a man who would protect mm. me. Mm. That is something that women tell their daughters. So in turning this whole male gaze thing, this is something we teach young women and God knows I was taught that. I was taught that if I kept my mouth shut, a man would want me. So when I was looking at Mene's Olympia, I was drawn in to that on a personal level by wondering what it is to be attractive. Wow. And then, that's yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 
Um, there's another uh, painting from the Olympia series um, in our presentation today that we'll move forward to now. Yes. Um, and perhaps you could uh, spend a couple of minutes yeah, um, I'll, I'll talking about this here. work as well. Sure, sure, this sure. One, I, I lifted straight from Gauguin. There's uh, everyone who knows art will know this pose. I put Kenyatta in the position of a young woman he has in a, in a both a painting and a woodcut that he's done where there's a god sitting at the bottom of that bed watching out for her and she can be asleep in the presence of his protection, the God's protection. I saw, I took the blue makeup because it's warrior makeup. Uh, it's always been used by Scott, Scottish clans as a way of covering or protecting their people with warrior makeup. And I have Anna applying it to Yetta, who's now the subject of the gaze, of the predator gaze. And again, I, I, I took, I turned a cat into a dog. Dogs have been throughout the history of art subjects of faithfulness and the flowers I have in a modern way that, that a man would buy them at a corner and throw them into a room pretending to be giving homage. And that's the way I see this painting. We did this in the Marriott Hotel in downtown Brooklyn. <laughs> we got a so... little trouble by the smell. We got thrown out. They were very cool with us for days, but the smell finally got us pitched. But yeah. Well, that's you know, um... This is this is great because um, as as Karen mentioned, I've known you um, for quite some time now. We don't need even need to get into the timeline, but I've known you for quite some time now. And uh, the first two paintings in this presentation, actually the first three paintings in this presentation, um, including the next one, are paintings that you created before I met you. So so these these are paintings that I um, saw within days of meeting you and doing my sort of. Uh, basic research online as anyone would more than a decade ago uh, at this point. Uh, once they meet an artist, they go on the internet and they Google and they uh, fish around and they try to figure out like who the hell is this person and what do they actually make. And I was, uh, for lack of a better word, I was gobsmacked by, um, the, uh, by the work that I saw you, that you had created. And I feel very fortunate because um, I have had the, um, the pleasure of seeing every single painting you've made in the past decade in progress, midway, and completion. Um, and so this particular work here, um, Portrait of Kenyatta and Brianna, um, I think one could safely say is a seminal work by you. Yes. Yes. Um, I think it was a work that was a turning point for you um, and has and sort of a gateway into a different direction for your, um, your let's say, practice. I, I know you're, you're sort of uh, ambivalent about that word practice. It's fine, it's but, fine. I'm used to it at this point, yes. <laughs> but a gateway um, um, for your practice. So, so let's, let's talk a little bit about Portrait of uh, Kenyatta and Brianna, because I think this is a good um, segue into a different, slightly different direction for this conversation. It is, Dexter. This is the first time I ever put white paint on anyone. And I put white paint on an African-American woman. And that is, that was a major act. And I know it. The way that this started, this began, was as an act of feminism. But I did know what I was doing, of course, when I put this on Kenyatta. I was, at the time, uh, my cousin's daughter was getting married. And she's told me that I botched the actual facts of this, but my memory of it was that her wedding reception was, was occurring in the High Museum of Atlanta. Mm. And it occurred to me suddenly that museums have become our secular churches. At the same moment, a, Mur a huge Murakami exhibition was occurring at the Brooklyn Museum a couple of blocks from my house. And at that same moment, Kenyatta, who was posing for me for an entirely different painting, saw this wedding dress that I had used in a previous painting lying on a chair in the studio, and she asked to put it on. And when I saw her in it, I was dazzled by the beauty of it. And then I thought about the fact, I had just seen a, I had just seen a, a dance performance in which the, the artist, I mean, the, the dancer had covered her entire self in white makeup so that she would become a cipher in the dance. She would reduce herself to having no personality whatsoever. And that clicked with me on what we tell young women when they become brides. We say to them all their lives, we want you to become who you are, as individuated as possible. Suddenly, we whip that around on their wedding day, and we say, whoa, 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 whoa. 
We want you to become idols. We want you to become projection screens upon which we can believe whatever we want to believe about this fairy tale of what it is to be a young woman. Which click back to my mother always telling me, be a blank screen to be loved. So I put this white makeup, I thought to myself, okay, you want a girl to be white on her wedding day? Dad, I'm going to cover her in white. I cover mm. Brianna, the little girl to the left, in white. That is Brianna, again, without makeup on, to the right, looking back at them, mm. thinking about what this implies about her own future. She's escaping it at that moment. Murakami actually used his own paintings to as wallpaper. I printed that wallpaper, found out later illegally, but I made it, I put it <laughs> on the floor. I know, I, no one sued me yet. That is an actual Murakami behind them. And I love the way that it looked like this dragon coming down upon Kenyatta. This was in the Smithsonian Portrait Show and it won People's Choice Award. And it, I was, it was, I was highly touted for that. Got to take the girls down to DC, um, taught Jay to swim. It was a really wonderful experience for all of us. Right, and right. it turned out to be quite wonderful. Yeah, I mean, and um, you know, this painting went on quite a journey that we don't need to get into. We didn't know that would be quite the divergence. <laughs> in yes. this, in yes. this conversation. Um, but it's let's, now simply in my brother-in-law's home, yes. Let's just say yeah. it, left the, it left the farm. Yeah wandered FBI in the was pasture yep, yep. the fbi was involved and yep. now it is back yep. uh it is back in the farm <laughs> that would be, that would be <laughs> so, so to yes. speak um it's actually quite ironic that uh this painting depicts um a, you know murakami's work in the background my being in japan and murakami being a oh, japanese yeah. artist um and and my um uh, first encounter with this painting was um actually um clearly one decade ago so uh, it's striking to me also in, in the sense that these are works, the first three works we've seen that, uh, that date back to, you know, 2006, 2007, 2010, uh, but they still have an urgency to them that I think, um, you know, make them uh, feel incredibly fresh um, and relevant today. Uh, you. you know, I, I think oftentimes people may forget that, you know, paintings are made, they're made in, you know, they're made in their time they're not necessarily always the reflection of every decision the artist who, who makes the painting has, has made. As you mentioned, um, Kenyatta and Brianna also were sort of involved in choosing what they would wear that day. Absolutely. Uh, they made, you know, they made conscious decisions to wear um, certain, certain items and you, uh, you know, you agreed with those decisions. And so the painting is a reflection, not only of your decisions and tastes and choices, but also theirs as well. And I think that that is something that um, as a viewer of work, uh, you often forget, right? That, that there's a certain level of agency that um, the person in the painting has also exercised um, in deciding, you know, to be in the work. So we have a lot of images to go through today. So I want to jump ahead to the next one. Um, because I think that this sort of like starts to begin this journey in using um, the white makeup and other colored makeup to uh, explore this idea that you already talked about. So can we spend a couple of moments on this particular work here, the artist? Sure. I was very concerned about putting white makeup on an African-American person because I was... I was looking at the fact, I was trying to make the point that if you look at the history of the world, white makeup has been put on every, and used in every single culture, cultures that didn't know each other, to enhance the purity of their women. Queen Elizabeth I was covered in makeup. Josephine almost died of lead poisoning because she was covered in white makeup. Always to erase the particular characteristics of the woman and turn her into something that ideas could be projected upon and she could be anything anybody wanted her to be, a blank screen. And when I wanted to do, you, you'll see going forward, I was told by a psychologist many years ago that at the age of seven, children for the first time in their lives start to be aware of the fact that they must, that they are not unconditionally loved, that they must perform in order to be loved and look to society for what those cues are and how they are to be loved. And this is, this is Jay at seven years of age. Jay is Kenyatta's niece. 
and has been a huge person in my life. I met her simply because Kenyatta was babysitting her and Jay kept wanting to be in the paintings and she's a real natural, as one can see. Um, she's a natural aristocrat. Every time she sits down, that's what she looks like. She always carries power. And frankly, she loved putting on makeup. She would never, she always chose her own clothes. I went shopping with Jay to David's Bridal when they were on sales. All <laughs> of the costumes you ever see Jay wearing were chosen by Jay. And I put her in this chair in front of this Murakami painting to, and she looks worried in it. To me, this is a painting about, all of my paintings are to me about having the kitchen sink thrown at women and that they, they push through it. You're, the pain is supposed to nullify this young woman, and yet, in my opinion, her soul, her personality, her actual integrity is so fixed at the age of seven that it pushes through all of that and still mm. announces itself. So I put the brush of white paint in her own hand to show you that she has taken away from you the ability to negate her and then she can put it on herself and still beat you at your own game. Fantastic. Um, and so I, I really want to uh, get through all of the works that I we know, have highlighted I know, I'm gonna, here. I know, I'm gonna keep it shorter, love. I know. Uh, no, 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 I, I, no. I, think, I think that this is, uh, this is why we're here, right? <laughs> yeah. This is yeah. why we're here. If, if we're not here to talk about the work, then what are we here for? <laughs> all right, all right, I just don't wanna go too far. Yeah, no. <laughs> right. no, no, absolutely, no, yeah. it's absolutely fine. Um, this Hector is as actually, usual, you're always better at this than I am, so I'll just take your lead. <laughs> no, it, you know, you know, I don't, I don't usually, pick uh, favorites, um, but I, I will say that this is actually one of my favorite paintings of yours okay. because I think that, because uh, I think there's a subtlety and sublimeness to this work that um, really um, forces you to spend time with it in a way that, um, you know, you may or may not know going into it, but this is one of those paintings that um, you just absolutely need to spend time with to sort of really read it and understand it. And I love speaking with you about the work. Um, so um, as you've done with the, the previous works, can you give us a little bit of insight into um, Isn't It Romantic? Sure, you just made me understand why Kent State chose this one too. I, I you know that this is the one they're gonna put in the show in October. This painting was actually, was created a bit by Jay. I, a lot of the time that Jay's in the room with me, I just watch her and I, she she literally will take these poses and hold. She picked. She loves that dress. She loved that dress. She picked that dress out. Cost a fortune, but I that was her dress. She put it on. She liked to walk around the room and she took this pose, and I was blown away by it. And she had the white makeup on her face at the time, but the fact that the back of her neck was this beautiful moment in the piece made me think of geisha makeup. I'm always trying. Mm to connect history to these paintings because the, mo the, the largest fact of my life has been the fact that I was born into a history, we're all born into histories we don't understand. Children certainly are innocent of what the burden of history is when they enter the world and yet they must navigate it. And you, with every single child that's born into this world. And geisha makeup is another form of whitening that's been used for hundreds of years. And in the Japanese culture, the most seductive moment in a woman's body was the nape of her neck. That was the one place that they allowed to be free and vulnerable. And I did this with Jay to underscore the vulnerability, but also I looked at this girl and I thought, this girl looks powerful. She may have the back of her neck exposed, but this is not someone one would trifle with. And she's seven. And I loved that. And the, I, I was working with the idea, the irony of the songs that I grew up with. I grew up with all these songs. Isn't it romantic? And I was a, the underscore for that for all young women is to somehow fit themselves into those songs. Be a heroine in those songs. Be someone who's desired. And isn't it romantic is, is the title of this. And Damn it, no. No, it's much more than romantic. No, and absolutely. yes, she's beautiful. That's the point of this painting.
Yeah, you know, I um, I had the pleasure of seeing this work in person. And so um, I, it's great to know that it's traveling to an exhibition in the fall. I've known a little bit about that Kent, Kent State opportunity for a while, and it's great that they've selected this work. So um, we're only partially through our presentation. Yeah, so I we're know. Gonna move, I, we're gonna, I, we're, you can We're going to move, move ahead to, to the ahead. next work, which is one of the uh, sort of rare works from this period that did yes. not involve any um, any makeup. white makeup. The and, reason, for, um, the reason yeah, for this is sure, specific. Sure. Yeah, she's six. This I know it sounds it sounds arbitrary, but it isn't. Um, after I was told, actually, Siri who's fake told me this that that the age of seven was the age of consciousness in terms of of knowing that one had to fit oneself into the society. She's six here, and in this painting, I saw her as this vulnerable child. I used a Kahinde Wiley painting on top of it because this painting is called "Someday My Prince Will Come." Another thing that I was taught all my life. There wasn't going to be anything about what I did in life. That the biggest win of my life was going to be someday when my prince would show up, take me away from myself, and protect me for the rest of my life. And that's both that's a, both a wonderful thing and a trap that you're taught all your life. And I knew that this is a world into which these young women are born. And I look at the candy. I, I had great sympathy for the young man in the Wiley painting who's fallen. This is, this is supposed to be the prince, but he's having a very tough time leading his own life, standing up, being a man. Mm. And I wanted that to be in the painting as well, some sympathy for the fact of the, for the prince at the same moment that these young girls are being filled with all this hooey to expect this poor young man to save them. Oh, such a, such delicate work, and so can we talk a little bit about the use of graffiti that I see um, oh, sure, in this yeah. work? There was also a bit in the previous work as well. I I was interested. Um, literally, yes. I was. I mean, a lot of it have is is literally what was put on the walls of the studio. In the next one, you can see things that I I just write on charcoal on the walls. I started using graffiti because it is a public form of protest hmm. and a public form of basically fighting despair. I always look at graffiti. Graffiti now has risen to a much more jubilant level. But in the beginning, it was a way for people who felt locked out of the world to scream mm. in the middle of the night illegally um, and to try to wake people up once they got on the subway in the morning. That I, I was, I've been here from the 80s. That's what I knew from graffiti. So I, I took a spray can. Jay actually freaked when she saw this. This would, she would <laughs> never have allowed this to happen on her pre, in her presence. That was on a mannequin when I did this, and she was not pleased. But I spray can, I just took a spray can and wrote, someday my prince will come across both of these dresses on mannequins and painted it that way. Again, underscoring the sense of despair that is underlying all these declarations that young men are saving right. women. Young women should wait for it all. And that people are desperately trying to get through. Right, right. Well, I see that thread and I think it's interesting that- Thank um, you for bringing it up. No, absolutely, absolutely. And, um, and, and this, this idea of, you know, the, the woman's uh, sort of role and agency looms so large in your work. And I think it's sometimes overshadowed by, um, let's just face it, the elephant in the room, you're being a, a, a white woman I know, who, often I know. Paints, who often paints black people. Um, and, and, I, and I really appreciate you taking the time to kind of dig into that and unpack that for the people who are participating in this of call. Of course. Um, and so- I mean, it's a legitimate listen. question, Dexter. I mean, it's right, certainly right. a legitimate question. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's, it's much more, I literally fell in love with this child. I have a large life with this child. I taught her to swim. She slept in, I, I, she's been a very big part of my life, she lived with me for periods of time. Her family life's been a tad chaotic. Um, and she's quite special. She was very right. small for her age, which made me always want to paint her large. Brianna, her her cousin to the right, Brianna's a math whiz and was always the kid who beat her at everything. Jay is naturally athletic. And for example, she learned, I taught her to swim in two days. It took me two days to get my own kids to put their face in the water. She, she's, she has great gifts that she could show off in front of me in a room alone. 
and mm. beat Brianna at her game. I mean, right. I, I love Brianna right. too, but Brianna wins every award on every level at every moment. One of the biggest things that happened with Jay in their school, there was a day that the, the, the Daily News had, oh, when that Smithsonian thing came up. No, no, it was something else. The Daily News had an article about me. And they all went to an assembly and the principal of Jay's school called her out and, and had her come up in front of the whole school and say, this is, the this is the subject of these paintings. And it was one of the biggest things that ever happened to me because she called me that day, this little meek voice, and she's a very strong voice, and she couldn't believe that that happened. And it was maybe <laughs> one of the best days of my life. <laughs> That's fantastic. But, yeah, yeah. It, it's, but I, why, I fell in love with this child. I will admit that I've never had an agenda per se about painting African-American people. I will, however, say that being a white child in a small Southern town, the largest fact you grow up with is shame. It is the lie of the people you're supposed to respect all around you and children are not stupid. They understand very early on that their questions my mother would always stop me i would ask her questions she would always ask me why questions so much and she would say because i told you so mm -hmm. and that was the first time i realized that power comes in and shuts down conversation right right but well. children know and i grew up in a world where african-american people were the bravest people i knew they were kind to me. They were good friends. My, my grandmother was lower middle class on my father's side. She worked in a mill. They, there were many African-American people in my life, unlike New York, which is much more segregated. And they were always incredibly kind to me. They never treated me in a way that, frankly, would have made more sense. Right. Uh, they were right, always given the, given right given the times and given the circumstances yeah or how they were treated dexter for god's yeah. sakes i remember yeah. i remember i remember the height i was because i remember how high the signs were my mother used to tell a joking story about we went to the dentist in the largest building in town it was a bank building it was marble everywhere and there was a water fountain one said colored and one said white at the top of the water fountain right. and there were these little right. stairs that you got on to go to the water fountain and I went to the one that said color, because what child doesn't go to color over <laughs> white? And my right. mother came in and swooped me out from under that water fountain. And for years, she would talk about that as a, an embarrassing story. And I could never understand the pitch of the story. Who should be embarrassed and over what? But, it, but I remember those things, Dexter. Right, I remember. Right. I remember my father having a friend at a crummy hot dog stand where we were exact, where we were going in the door. And my father had a friend who was standing at a door, a screen door over which he was to get a hot dog. It's a crummy hot dog stand. But he was African-American. My dad was white. We got to go in the dump. And the man he was talking to, we were talking to him going up to the door. And then that happened. And right. nobody tells the kid why. <laughs> so I grew up, I grew up in shame. So in many it, ways, yeah, so in many ways, you, you, yeah. well, you, you, grew, you grew up as a witness, you know, you grew up as, as a witness to injustice, a witness to a society that has structured itself in a way that, <clears throat> as we all know, um, was going to subjugate a significant portion of its population for the advancement of the other. Um, but, um, but we have a lot to get through today. I'm sorry. I'm so, sorry. I just, that's I, the only time I'll do it. I just no, wanted no, to no. try I, to explain. I, it's, it's no, it's absolutely important um, that we get that background and that understanding. Let's, let's move ahead to the next okay, work, uh, uh, White Fives, uh, from the series Painting the Roses Red, um, White Fives. And, um, you know, this, again, I think is a work that also begins to sort of turn the corner a bit um, for you as well. Uh, this work was created in 2012 and uh, also begins to evoke, um, you know, um, perhaps uh, Marie Antoinette and, and other sort of like aspects of history 
So let's spend some moments on this particular work. Again, Jay did this. I, Jay was standing in a room in that dress, which again, did not, of course, have red paint on it. She loved that dress. She was walking out of the room, going to the bathroom, and she turned back at me and I saw this. She had, for her 12th birthday, her mother had given her extensions. And when I went to pick her up to paint her, those extensions, I will admit, um, depressed me because it made her look much older. And when she got to my studio, I asked her how she felt about them. And she yelled at me and she said, they itch like crazy and I hate them. And I handed her a comb and she started taking them out. And she was on her way to the bathroom and the, the top of her head, she had released from the extensions. And I suddenly realized that exactly looks like 18th century hair dues on the court of Marie Antoinette, Watteau, everybody liked that, where they had those puffy curls and those long fake curls going down the back. And I stopped her there and I thought, okay, I'm going to turn her into one of those heroines. Dexter, I should say this, the reason that I fought so hard in my life to learn to paint like this is because when I was nine and went to see my first painting, the, the, the New York City school system put us in a bus and took us to the New York, to North Carolina Art Museum. First time I ever saw a painting. And I walked in and I was floored by seeing paintings that were, they looked like doors into which you could just walk, but it was the language of power. And I wanted to make, to use that language, learn that language to give anybody I painted that level of power. The reason, quickly, I do want to say one more thing about that the previous painting. In terms of, it's called Painting the Roses Red because I, the Lewis Carroll's treatise, Alice in Wonderland, is the large, best treatise on adolescence that ever occurred. Jay was to turn 12 here. And the point of the moment that I'm painting this is that the, the queen comes in and she wants to kill all of her subjects. She wanted red roses painted and they painted, they, they I mean, um, grown and they grew white roses. And she screams at them, off with your heads unless they're red roses. So everybody runs around painting the roses red. And all I could think about was the perfect parallel of the insanity. White roses are not less beautiful than red roses. Color is preposterous in terms of rating beauty. And of course, them painting the roses red made them die. So that this was also for me a painting about the, the ridiculous nature of declaring one color better than another. That's it, I got, that's all I got. I can't hear you, you're muted. <laughs> we're halfway through right. our images, but we're, right. we're, but we're, <laughs> but we're um, actually down to, uh, you know, the less Six than minutes. the 20 minute mark. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> all right conversation. Right. So, 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 here's, so here's what I want to do. Um, yeah. So that we don't um, leave, uh, as they say, leave too much money on the table. We have a lot of images here. All right. Why don't, we, why don't we go through the next um, few images um, and give them each perhaps uh, a 60 second um, I'll do it. Little, I can do it. Uh, Trust me, overview. I can do it. Mm -hmm. Go back to Babes mm -hmm. in the Woods. I wanna, I, quickly, I want to say about this, all I want to say about this is that that's a painting where they are, they are four and a half years old. Therefore, there is no makeup on them. The paint mm -hmm. has therefore, the makeup paint has therefore become trees that's falling mm -hmm. around them. The paint is mm -hmm. encroaching upon them, but it hasn't touched them. Mm -hmm. And let's move on to the next work so, here, Dow. Right. That is a pastel uh, done of Kenyatta's daughter when Khalees was, I think, three years old. She simply looked at me like that and I made a pastel of her. And the fact mm -hmm. that there's white, a blonde hair to the right of her, um, the word doubt actually was given, the painting title was given to it by um, John Driscoll. And he said that that's what it looked like to him. Mm. And that's mm. where it stands. I'm proud of that piece. Uh, and sorry for the rapid fire, but we're going to no, go no, to the no. next work. We're going go to go to the fair. next work as well. See. All right. The next, the next one is coming from a James Baldwin. James Baldwin has been a major influence in my life. This is the first painting that I did called Nakedness Has No Color. Uh, the line from, it's a poem that says, nakedness has no color, that can come as no surprise to anyone who has ever covered or been covered by another naked human being. And it's a beautiful comment about love. And Baldwin has been a large influence in my life. This woman was somebody who had been, has been a model for me before she lost her hair. She has a severe case of alopecia. 
I put her in this tub for, this started off being a horizontal painting where I was gonna paint her in a bathtub. I literally put it on the, uh, I left it up to dry standing up and realized it felt like more like an arch that you would see in a religious situation. Mm -hmm. And I left it that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. That's how that and so, And so this particular work is called Nakedness Has No Color from the Goddess Series One. And then yep. the, the work that comes after it is also called Nakedness Has No Color and Knows No Border. That's of a man, yes. I, I extrapolated right. a little bit on the on the uh, Baldwin. So, yes, so this is a good this is a good moment to pause for okay. a moment. And instead of talking about um, the sort of socio political or psychological reasoning behind the works, let's get into the technical aspects of actually creating the work. I imagine okay. there are a number of people on this call who are artists themselves or sure. aspiring artists or collectors or individuals who are interested in the process of making the work. So um, can you talk a little bit about how you um, use these different elements? From, from what anyone um, looking at this can see, there's an aspect of sort of like wallpaper here that is burning. There's some, uh, wor there are words that are obviously not in English that are written behind the model. Can we sort of deconstruct this painting from uh, sort of a contextual standpoint? Sure. Quickly, I went into, I saw a show at the Metropolitan Museum called the Decon Plateau. It, was, it was, blew my mind. It was basically, it was a show that showed the first time that dark people ever saw white people. And it was on the Deccan Plateau, it was a trading plateau, and it was in India. And this was a scroll in that show, and in place of the man that I have portrayed in that space was a purple devil. And where I've got fighter planes, there were fleur de lis. And it, it had, had a, a sentence written in Farsi above it. What's written in Farsi above it, his head is the title. It took, it took me longer to find somebody who could still right. write that <laughs> in that calligraphy. Finally, a French professor had an uncle, whatever. I finally got that translated and therefore could paint it. The painting is basically about a collision uh, of history, which is something that is extremely important to me. Um, mm -hmm. This young man, for example, has, a, has the most important thing to him. He's an, al he's an albino. He's a very famous model now, Justin. But he came to me to ask and ask me, has to work with me. He's an extraordinarily beautiful, wonderful young man. And he, I gave him a dish of black makeup and he put that on himself. And it, it, he's got a, bat, a Batman insignia bracelet on him and it, it completely mirrors that. What, mm -hmm. what am I doing with this painting? Um, you can see, I have, I'm playing with the fact that I want you to believe that he's both three-dimensionally there, but also a piece of paper that's burning because it's burning all the way around you. Technically, how did I do it? I paint, I learned, taught myself to paint old school. These are linen canvases. Um, I sized them with rabbit skin glue. I put three different layers of leaded oil primer on them, scrape them down, sand them the whole nine yards. Then right. I put something called an imprimatur, a tint, a tint, a very um, thin application of light gray paint over top of them, always streaky so that the white bounces from the behind. And then I mm -hmm. begin laying out the painting. And frankly, oh. I kill my students for this. And if any of them are listening, they'll scream. I always <laughs> say to them, I always say to them, let me see a full sketch because I teach composition. Right, and, right. But I don't follow those rules. I painted him first, and then I asked myself, where is he? And then the Deccan Plateau clicked it. Ah, I see, I That's see. That's the truth. I see. So, so let's, let's jump ahead to the Go next ahead. work. Um, yeah, that, now let me talk about this a minute. <laughs> well, this is and, so, and so, right. And you so, can kill so, the next, you can let the two, next two go by. <laughs> okay, so, so we'll, we'll, we'll spend some time on this. We'll skip the next two skip so we next can, two we can wrap up in, in time. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You uh, can skip this it. is 15 in 2015 and the previous work is called One Child. You go backwards. Yes, right. but, you can but let's go, go back. Yeah, yeah. Let's go backwards to tangled up, tangled, in blue. tangled up in blue. This is an important painting to me because it's the only the second painting I ever did of a man, and frankly, it is the story of you. When I met you, <laughs> well, <laughs> story it, of is. Me. <laughs> it is. I, I don't mean it is. It is true. I paint people I love and know. When I met you, I was struck most strongly by the fact that at, when you were a kid. You were married very young, you had a baby, and you made a decision 
that you were going to be a father to that boy and you traveled every weekend from Brooklyn to New Jersey to pick him up as an infant and bring him back home. And you told me your life was SpongeBob and Pampers. And all I could think about was if my son who had had that baby, I would be the person taking care of that child every weekend. And your mother was gone already by then. And I was incredibly impressed by that Dexter. I was incredibly impressed by a man who understood what fatherhood meant. And in this painting, Tangled Up in Blue, of course, alludes to the, to the song by Bob Dylan, which is a time travel song. And what I wanted this painting to evoke was the same thing. Paint can murder. If you think about Goldfinger, the old movie Goldfinger, it can suffocate a person. It's also used to make people feel powerful. It has many different uses, both lethal and to imbue power. In this, in this painting, I want this explosion of blue to hit you, the father. In my opinion, the father takes on the weight of the world so that his son, center, your son, Dylan, can escape that. And between the two of you, I have you in an extraordinarily ritzy townhome that I got off the internet in Manhattan, but I've been in those places. They cost a fortune and men go through hell to be able to earn the money to buy those homes. So to me, this is a painting about what that man has gone through to create that home for his child. And in the next room, you see through it to a painting I did of Jay. And she had no father to protect her in that way. So she did, the paint did hit her. That painting is in one of the most important of my life. Well, it's interesting about this work, besides the fact that I'm in it, <laughs> um, is that it was my first opportunity to obviously, well, 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 actually, it's my first opportunity to be in one of your paintings, but really to be in any painting. I, I never actually uh, imagined that anyone would ever want to include me in a painting. So that was a, it was an honor. Uh, as much as that word honor is used, it was actually an honor, but also it was great to sort of experience what that process is like between sort of model and, and, and artist or subject and artist. Um, because when, I, when you gave me the blue paint, it was really up to me to decide what to do with it, right? And, um, and, and we had I, to worry and, about and to, that jacket. <laughs> and, and, to be, and to be frank, uh, we thought, you know, well, I thought going into it that I would know exactly what to do, but I, but I found that once I had the blue paint on my hands, it was sort of, uh, you know, not clear to me what my next move was. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, was, it was a great experience. I thank you for that. I, I think that what came out of this work, and this has nothing to do with me being in it, but I think what came out of this work was, um, you know, so like if we go back through the past, uh, you know, 10 or so paintings that we've looked at, um, some of these works are sort of touch, touchstones, right? Yes. Where yeah. you, you arrive at a point you, and, and it sort of changes your direction. And then the works that follow that, you can kind of see that they sort of are imbued with this new idea and this new direction, right? Um, so true. it's like we're turning corners, turning corners. So speaking of turning corners, let's skip ahead to um, the last two works we have here. Uh, one of them is uh, Goddess series, Mother and the Bride. So it's right. uh, number go 16. So it's the second to last. Go, you, you know what? Hit power before we go out. I'd rather do okay, power. Okay, so we go that. back with Hit power. power. You okay, do sorry. one power, we'll do one of the last ones. There we go. Great, great, the great. Reason, the reason I want to do power is it links up with the last. It, 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 go, it speaks to your point. I started using money at that point. It, I turned money into flowers. Mm -hmm. I did an installation using money. It was, I asked myself, what do people really think is beautiful? And they think money is beautiful. And I turn it into flowers because they also say that they think that flowers are beautiful. But what, they, what, what does money really hold? It holds the right. picture of the most powerful men in the world. Right, right, right. And, and I have in this painting both African made, uh, paintings, I mean, flowers made from African money and from American money. The hundred dollar bills right. are burning up. But what I'm most important thing to me about this painting is I'm fusing a Turner. I'm fusing a Fragonard, a Turner. I'm trying to make history be something that you see is surrounding this child upon her birth. And that laser movement that shoots through the middle is saying to you, now, this thing right. is popping you now. That's the point. Right. That's it. Right. That's all I
No, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So let's go. Let's yeah, go to the look, final look, final look. two works here, and also okay. um, just letting people know we're inside of the ten minute mark. So if there are questions, um, we certainly. Um, so there's one question here before you move on. Uh, no. Someone asked, do you, do you work from still life or from photographs? So maybe you can spend a moment on both. that. I work from both. In the beginning, like the, the Olympia paintings, I would not work from photographs at all. Um, I, at this point, have been, I do work from photographs, but I can never do it purely. I have to bring the people back in or know them really well, to be honest. If I know right. them really and, well. And, and, let's, and, let, and let's be clear here. How long can you have someone sitting in a bathtub in water, right? <laughs> there would be that. Oh yeah, you, there would be that. Jay has been, was, the, was a person who could bring you to shame. That kid could stand for 45 minutes. I always had a movie on, a little, you know, like the, di like the dentists do now. There was to be a little movie on. A movie their mother wouldn't let them see and there'd be m ms in the room. So I was kind of right. the crack house. So, so I, I got, I did, I could do a lot of work from life by, you can't see it, but by allowing things they couldn't have to be in the room. But yes, both of these, these paintings began, the ones you're looking at right now, they began from photographs, but they're right. groups of photographs, not a single photograph. The woman on the left is a very close friend of mine, the novelist Catherine Harrison. And the young woman on the right is her daughter, Julia Harrison. Um, I've known Julia since she was in utero. What she represents, I paint her a great deal. And what she represents to me is um, what everybody thinks they want a girl to be. Julia's six feet tall, blonde hair to her waist. She's going to be a road scholar, a whole nine yards. And I have learned through Julia, knowing Julia, that it ain't all wonderful to be that mm. gorgeous. Every time you walk in a room, people have a chip on their shoulder when they meet you. Uh, really? You got that? I mean, it's like meeting an incredibly famous person. I've also had very famous people say this to me, very rich people. A lot of people want to take them down a notch. Mm -hmm. And other mm -hmm. folks, they give a shot. And this, mm -hmm. this girl is actually rather shy. The painting is about the mother who's smoking a joint in the bathtub to the left, um, looking at us very directly with the knowledge of what the hell it means to be a woman. And the makeup, she's streaked through. And her daughter on the right is, a, is in bridal attire in that same bathtub. And what I mean by the bathtub is she's in, she's in the swim of all of the history and all of the noise and the nonsense that, cre that is in the background of what it is to become her. And she's mm. looking askance and looking off to the right. Mm. And she's mm. being, she's, yeah, that's, that's the story of it. No, uh, uh, thank you. So, so we're no. down to the final five minutes and we're gonna get to the final painting. And I think this is a-, a Well a, done, appropriate, well done. Appropriate well painting done. to end right. on. Yes. Because right. it is the yeah. first painting in, in everything we've looked at today. But frankly, I think in the old time I've known you, it is it the is. first painting that I've seen where you have painted yourself. That's true. I, I am a four-year-old child in the painting, in this painting on the left side. I actually had a photograph of myself taken on my fourth birthday on a table and I put a cup of coffee on it. And I thought about the fact that I didn't have a great relationship with my mother growing up. She did greatly like to take pictures of me. She, my mother's, long story short, my mother has Cherokee blood going back a few generations. And I was the brown haired, brown eyed, black, black eyed child. And she used to call me the Cherokee child as a joke. Her, she had two daughters who died, two sons who lived both all blonde and blue eyed. Every Barbie my mother ever gave me was blonde and blue eyed. And my mother for a supplement to her income made Barbie cakes. She was famous in the neighborhood for them. The great thing about the pound cake was you, my mama made good pound cakes. You stuff the Barbie in them, then you decorate the cake to look like the dress, the antebellum dress. That's right behind me on the left. And what I, I took Julia, the model we were just talking about, and put her in real life. And I, I felt that it took on a little bit of a Joan of Arc quality also mm. to have those mm -hmm. candles blazing around her. Mm -hmm. But so it's a bitch to be a woman on any level. All right. I was told that I wasn't the right thing because I wasn't blonde and blue eyed. Then I was too big. I mean, you know, th there's always something being mm. leveled against me. And Julia is supposed to be everything in the world you want but it's not all song it's not all roses so that's well, someone asked thinking. someone asked yeah. did the relationship did the relationship with your mom ever change and the what did the relationship with your mother ever change 
actually, no, I don't want to, uh, no. The only way that, um, well, well. I know, it's a, it's a heck of a I'm question so, to sorry. lob I'm at so you in the, a, final, in the final couple it's, of moments. It's a fair question, it's a fair question. The only way that it changed was by becoming, my mother died, and before she died, I believe there'd be a moment at which she would want to see me. I'm sorry, but it didn't no, happen. It's, it's okay. It's sorry, okay. Sorry. Well, I mean, you know, yeah, these, moving on. Yeah. You know, well, we, you know, with these, these are the, uh, the the things that I think have sort of uh, bonded you and I together in many ways. Um, it's true, you know, I, I had a different kind Good of relationship. Save, yeah. with, I, you know, I had a different kind of relationship with my mom, of course. But I also, um, I understand how, um, you know, loss, you know, loss, I think, is the, is the common denominator. Um, yes, true. You know, and, and, and here's the thing. You, you can lose someone while they're alive. I never had my mother. And I always you know. thought that I would get her. And, you know. that, and the death means that you've got to deal with the fact it's never going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So, Quinn, so you're, Quinn and I so, Yeah, so your work is a testament to that fortitude, a testament to a journey that you've been on for, you know, the, you know, the years that you've been in this world. And, um, and frankly, meeting you changed my life in ways that we don't have time to get into in the Thank final, you, uh, final oh, 60 I'm seconds of, 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 of this I'm conversation. Here, Dexter. So, sure. We do have a few more minutes and this has been great. And I just wanted to, to see if we can get a few more questions in here. Sure. sure. And I won't Absolutely. cry, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so, so someone just asked the question about the uh, the Kent State exhibition that's scheduled for October. Do you uh, have a bit more info on that? It was originally called Black Hair, and now it's called Textures. Um, so originally it was basic. It was about African American hair, and now they backed it into textures. Um, so be honest with you, I don't completely know. They're lovely people. And um, it's a large show. That's all I know. I yeah, know. right. So, I, so I'd imagine once Kent State um, gets all of their ducks in a row, it should be on their website. I'm sure if you were to yeah, Google text people. textures exhibition Kent State, um, that should take October. you um, someplace where you have some information about that. Uh, we have a, we have another a moment for okay. maybe one or two more questions if they come in. If they, the I, I'm looking now. There's some sure. On the uh, right. So what I'm looking. Yeah. Um, so on the chat, I only see. Do you work from still life or photographs? And the question about Kent State. Am I missing? Um, yeah, am I Q and A. So if you if you hit the chat button, there will be some questions there. And let's one, see. Yeah. Let's go into the chat. Okay. Oh. Okay. Great. Um, when did you first pick up a brush? Right. Oh. There you go. Um, I was the kid in, in, junior, in, in elementary school who did all the bulletin boards for the teachers. I worked in temper paint and I literally was, was handed out from one teacher to the other. Um, I've never known a time when I didn't have a brush in my hand. It was temper paint in school and that's what I, I did. I did the bulletin boards. Right. <laughs> so <it>. I... <laughs> And so back into chat, um, someone is just saying hi, that's great. Um, we already went through the question about the relationship with your mom. Um, okay, so here's a question. Um, can you talk about the importance of scale in your work? If, and so I guess we'll end on that because we're at okay. the one hour mark here. Understand, sure. I understand. The scale, the reason the scale started off in my work was a lot of it had to do with Jay being little. Jay's, Jay's head was like the size of a grapefruit, but she has this massive presence when you're around her. She takes over any room she's in, and I, damn it, I wanted you to have to look her in the eye. And that's why, I mean, again, my stuff, I know people are sitting there thinking, wow, what an intellectual this broad is, but I, I am, my ideas are become, are generated by the person before me, that if somebody enters my consciousness and they click with something in me that I need. When you were talking about my fortitude, what I really pay about is other people's fortitude. That this little girl could hold on to so much dignity in those circumstances humbled me a lot and therefore I made her bigger than me. 
Wow. Well, Margaret, thank you pretty, so much. Pretty primitive statement, yeah. Dexter, <laughs> no, Dexter, no, I'm absolutely. Only the fact that you felt good about posing for me, okay? Honored and all that, you know? Okay. Thank you. Just, just a thought. It's other people for listening, okay? But I, what I would like to say is there's a few questions in here. I'd just like to take a couple more minutes here. I've got it. I've got yeah, some go really important questions here, Dexter, if you don't mind, uh, both in the chat. Sure, sure. Absolutely. So I'm going back into the chat now and I see in the Q&A, uh, there's a question. Um, how do you feel that those views about color and gender have changed in modern society? I mean, or do you feel they've changed? I think this, I want to, I want to make two, I want to make a comment about uh, a man named Randall Horton. Um, what, Randall Horton is one of the most important people I ever met. He's a poet. He's a, he's a musician. He's got two big books out, um, one called Hook, one's coming out called Dead Weight. It's gonna probably be made into a mini series. Randall Horton, when I was terrified about painting African-American people, was somebody who called me up. He said, I wanna feature you in, a in something called a Title Basin Review. It was an, uh, an art quarterly that was being created in Virginia. A man's a preposterous poet. He's won a, one award after another. And I walked into a coffee shop and Randall Horton opened his arms to me and everything else was okay after that. Randall, artists need permission to do things. Artists are not people who need, are searching for ideas. Ideas are hitting them from the back of their head all day long. And, they, and there needs to be somebody who says it's okay. And Randall, like you have, to be honest, Randall was the first person who said, you be you and it's okay. And his, the intelligence of this man, the depth of his life, and frankly, the fact that he was one of the finest artists I had ever known, made, gave me the permission to be myself. And in terms of black-white relations, in my personal opinion, they've become much more strained than they've ever been before in my life, but I understand it. And I understand it very much. It's hurt, I've, I've been hurt a great deal by people um, saying that I have no right to paint African-American people. African-American people who've bought my work tell me that's not true, but I've gone through a couple of very bad years over this issue. And I understand it, African-American, I will, I, I say this to my students all the time, African-American artists have kept figuration alive. The best figurative artists alive today are African-American artists. Carrie James Marshall, Nathaniel Mary Quinn. I mean, you, you can go on and on. These are the best artists alive today. And they are the ones, they've got, they've got a story like the Italians had in the Renaissance, the Christian story. They've got a story that powerful to tell. And I do understand what right have I to take to come in and say that I have some part in that. God knows I was not a victim in the South like any African-American person ever was. All I can say was bear witness to the fact that I know how awful it was that I bear hideous shame over that and that it is with me every hour of my life. When I, during the COVID virus, I was trying to figure out the first person I didn't want to paint an African-American person. I was getting mousetraps at the hardware store. I walked up the hill. There was this preposterously beautiful girl on a bike. And I found myself saying, will you pose for me? Angelica Best said yes. So I'm painting Angelica Best, okay? You know, I mean, that's who I am. I can't, I, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. But um, I asked, I asked to be forgiven for oh. wanting to, to be here. Yes. So, so yeah. there's a painting behind you. Yeah. Let's talk yeah, about the right. painting behind this you. Is, that's Jay. That's an old one. That's Jay. You can see the scale of Jay. This is Jay called Motions of Grace. It's a painting I did. I, I did a, I saw a painting of her um, where she just puts her arms over her head and she does her head back like that. And it was preposterously beautiful. And I looked at the negative of of, excuse me, I've got another painting on by Anne Rittenberg called Blue Jay. That's another, it's, it was a pastel version of a negative. And what, what intrigued me about it was suddenly she was, she had dark skin and her hair was white because with the white makeup on her, suddenly the, the negative reversed it so that she had dark skin. And that intrigued me. It, 
color of somebody's skin is preposterous. When I teach painting, one of the things I do is put someone dark complected in a bright light and put someone with my complexion in a shadow and it freaks people out. Who's on first? There's no such, color is light passing over an object. There is no, there is no reality. We all know that. There's no reality to race. There's no, re, there's no scientific reality. There's no significance to color. It's what you make of it. And what is made of it in my culture throughout our, our times is just horrible. It's simply the worst thing about this country. And it is the great shame of this country upon which we are built. And frankly, it is the only important conversation that I know about, and I don't know how to paint without it. Okay, there's, there's one to throw out there, all right. Well, well, um, yeah, okay. I think, we I, I think that that, that, yeah. that is a, that is the moment, uh, a great moment to, to end on. Uh, okay. I'm just kind of panning the questions. I think we have uh, answered either uh, inadvertently or directly <laughs> the questions that have been asked um, today. So I just want to thank you um, so much for your time um, for doing this. And uh, I've been getting notes of thanks from the people who participated in the, in the Zoom as well. So um, well done. Bravo to well, you. Dexter, we, you, you enable all this. You've been doing it for 10 years. <laughs> Thank you very much, honey. It's great to see you. First time I've seen you real live from Japan in three months. I so, know. Crazy, crazy thing. It's a long Mark, damn time. <laughs> what a wonderful afternoon we've had uh, this last hour in this conversation with you two good, good friends. And it's been a truly a, a delight. And I think the, the uh, people, the audience has enjoyed it. So, I encourage you to go out and have a beautiful day. Enjoy this wonderful Memorial Day weekend. And Dexter, continue celebrating that anniversary with your beautiful wife this whole weekend and your time in Thank Japan. you. Thank you. And Karen, Karen, thank you for this opportunity. You were one of the people, I was talking about other people who've been, enable me to go on. And you, you're talking to me long time on the phone, is a person who's said to me, go on, go forward. And it's meant the world to me. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Very much. And thank you all. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.